Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Spitfire on my tail, part 10. Rarely did anyone stand up and challenge these orders to drink. In my experience, only one, Stangel, with whom I shared a room, who really hated these parades, did. When it happened again, he took it for a while and then he refused a beer from the orderly. Tottering uncertainly to attention, he announced that if this bloody game is a prerequisite to becoming an officer, I'll fucking shit on it. The audience was stunned into silence, the only sound being Stangel's boots on the floor as he staggered an uncertain course to the door, slamming it shut as he left. In horror, we waited for the storm to break, but nothing happened. Once again I learned that you only have to stand up to that kind of thing and it stops. Maybe it's no fun anymore for the perpetrators. Most of the Condor Legion men had good cars, they'd earned a lot of money in Spain. Traffic rules didn't really exist and nobody was too worried about drinking and driving. A visiting circuit usually involved many of the local guest houses, with a crew getting steadily more and more drunk and outlandish as they went. Even in public, some of them didn't seem to observe any protocol at all. The local population, however, was very understanding, dismissing some of their revelry because they had such a hard time in Spain, they must have seen the most awful things. Let them blow off a little steam, they said. One Hauptmann was famed for never running out of beer. Unlike the other Spaniards, he had not bought a top-of-the-range car, only a little DKW Reichsklasse with two seats and a large lidded boot at the back. Over the weekend, he would put a barrel of beer in the open boot of the car and make a tour, offering people, who he met along the way, a drink. Often he was joined by some of the others and they would tour as a convoy. I suppose it was harmless in a way, but had little to improve the reputation and standing of the Luftwaffe. After the incident with Anton Stangel, we were not required to attend the casino so often. Instead, we were allowed out of camp to the town of Schwäbisch Hall, something for which we heartily thanked the guts of our comrade Anton. Although it was a 40-minute walk, it made a change to get away from the airfield. It was now January of 1938 and Faschingszeit, a kind of celebration with extra dances, parades and many costume parades, etc. It was a nice time for us. We had discovered a special place called Ritter, which, no doubt, our officers would have found to be below them. That, for us, was a positive endorsement of an establishment. There was good music, a small dance floor, and we would meet a few of the local girls. Best of all, it was within our price range. In the middle of the floor was an old wood-burning pot-bellied iron stove, which was the only means of keeping a reasonable temperature when it was below freezing outside. One evening, for no apparent reason, one of our number went berserk and attacked the stove with his bare hands. He wrenched the angled stovepipe off the back, burning his hands in the process and releasing the flames and smoke right into the room. Suddenly, people were screaming as some of the paper garlands caught fire and for a while all hell broke loose. We managed to get him under control and to put the fire out with buckets and fire extinguishers. Soon, all was back in order and our poor comrade couldn't remember a thing that had happened or why. Maybe it was just an accumulation of stress and alcohol which had to boil out in some way. The net result was that the owner called the police and they took his name. We reported it to our group commander and he wasn't unduly worried, but it must have come to the ears of the base commander who had already had a lot of trouble with the mayor and that was the end of our friend's career as an officer. It was especially sad in his case because he had worked his way up from the ranks and was proud of his achievement. We argued on his behalf, but it was no use. He handed in his equipment and was on his way back to his old unit, a very disheartened young man. On a lighter note, we were invited to participate in one of the parades which are part of a fushing. We had permission from the base to decorate one of our trucks as a float. There were lots of local bands and one from the Luftwaffe which provided traditional music along the whole of the route. We youngsters caught the eye of many of the housewives and they threw candy to us from the windows. Later, we received many invitations to households for tea and to meet the family, especially then there was a young daughter approaching a marriageable age. It was refreshing to be with a family again and to meet the girls, but not much else happened in those days. When fushing was over, so was our time with the bomber group. As we packed up the decorations, so it was time to pack up our kit ready to return to Werder, where stage 3 of our training awaited us. That was how it was planned, but we were the first course and nobody really knew what we were to do during the next nine months. Then, as though it had always been part of the carefully planned curriculum, it was announced that we were to be sent skiing to improve our health and fitness. I thought that it was a great idea, having grown up on primitive skis on the Schwäbische Alb. 
During our time together, we had already exchanged many personal details and I knew that it was only myself and a chap called Ziggy Gruel who had any experience. So, not for the last time, I was appointed as ski instructor along with Ziggy. I had learned to ski in Ochsenwang as a child, but Ziggy had been a ski instructor himself. After finishing high school, he had taken some time out to earn some extra money. In the summer, he was a tennis coach and in the winter, he taught skiing. Certainly, he was an excellent skier. Our officers had arranged for the loan of a mountain hut from an infantry regiment for a month. All three platoons would be rotated during that month, us being the first. Ziggy and I had been sent forward as the advanced detachment to get things set up for the rest of the platoon. The hut itself was ideal for us, really out in the wilderness, a complete break from the strict routines of flying school. It was situated near to Oberstaufen, but there was nothing really local at all. An infantry Feldwebel was in charge of the hut, along with two cooks. They had things well organized, ready for their first guests from the Luftwaffe. Straw mattresses were laid out, together with clean linen. Everything was prepared. We wondered if things were always done this well, or if instructors had been issued to show these Schlipsoldaten how the army didn't do things by halves. I had achieved the Militärflugzeugführerschein and I felt that something had changed inside me, a maturity. I had actually done something which a year and a half before had seemed impossible. Even during the infantry training, I had wondered if I would be intelligent enough to make the grade and to live through the apparently mindless behavior of the NCOs and their exercises like Flagge Lucy. Around Easter of 1938, things were so much different. I spent a few days with my family at Heutigsheim. Helga, my youngest sister, was now four and Trude was 16. How proud they were of their big brother in his colorful uniform. Best of all were the wings on my breast pocket. And there were other aspects of my new status as a pilot and officer candidate in Göring's Luftwaffe, which pleased me. My father's position as headmaster of the school had been a little tenuous for some time. One of the other teachers held the high rank of Ortsgruppenleiter in the NSDAP, which is the chief of the local party chapter, and felt that this entitled him to a position senior to my father in the school, irrespective of his experience or qualifications to teach. However, my appearance seemed to mollify his supporters in the NSDAP and, for the time being, father's position was secure. All of this helped my self-confidence. I had set goals and I had attained them. In retrospect, those first few concrete steps did much to shape my approach to the problems and challenges that were to come. I wasn't interested in politics, but what I saw and heard only helped to convince me that I would be part of putting my country back in its proper position in world affairs. All my reference points told me that we were on the right course for the right reasons. The state had figured large in the backgrounds of both my parents. Father had been raised in an orphanage and mother had received a substantial part of her education via government scholarships. This gave rise to a mood in the home that the government was a generous benefactor and that it was generally right. Germany was now beginning to stand strong with full employment and a fast-growing economy. On the radio and in the newspapers everything was success and growth. Hitler had broken the chains of the Versailles Treaty. The new German eagle was no fledgling anymore. In the armed services, we remained quite detached from the rest of the population by virtue of our military status. The airfields and barracks were always a little remote from the larger towns, generally 5 to 15 kilometers away, and were under guard, offering little opportunity for social interaction outside. Sometimes we would go out to local cafes and restaurants by public transport, but even there we stayed in a group, rarely cultivating any local friendships. Even if we did, it wouldn't last long because we were constantly on the move. Sometimes, though, friendships did form. Back in the winter of 1937 to 1938, during our course 3 at Wildpark, we had to attend dancing classes at Potsdam, platoon by platoon. The idea was to finish us off as potential officers and gentlemen. The girls with whom we danced were an interesting group, mainly from the good class families in the area. It was here that I met Gerda Havemann. She usually attended some of the other classes, but by occasionally swapping attendances with other girls for various reasons, we came into contact. Once she came with a person who I took to be her older sister and we managed to stay together as a group for much of the evening, having a wonderful time. At the end of the evening, I accompanied the girls to the station at Potsdam and, being very excited about the whole evening, I even jumped up onto the running board of the train to snatch a kiss from the older sister as the train pulled out. A while later, I was invited to visit the family at their home at Babelsberg, not far from the German Ufa Film Company studios. 
As soon as I arrived, I was whisked aside by the older sister, who explained that she was, in fact, Gerda's stepmother. That, of course, terminated my interest in that direction. But Gerda and I got on well enough. Professor Havemann, then in his 50s, had been the composer of the music for the 1936 Olympic Games and for the musical score for the film of the event. This had greatly ingratiated him to Dr. Goebbels and the other members of the government, resulting in his appointment as Reichsmusikdirektor. However, he didn't fit in with the fawning yes-men that surrounded the political leaders and was never shy to speak out regarding music and the direction which German music would take. He maintained that he was an artist, a musician, not someone to blindly follow the orders of people who didn't have his depth of knowledge. Consequently, he withdrew from the post and concentrated on his own work. Around June, Gerda went off to work in a forester's house near Grünberg in what was then Silesia. We wrote to each other for a while and it was obvious that she was lonely. I learned that the forester took guests at the house and so, at Pentecost, I made arrangements to stay at the house without telling Gerda. She was really overjoyed to see me, but we couldn't spend too much time together because she had to work. There wasn't much for me to do, so by the end of the week I was really glad to get away. We kept up writing for a while and when she transferred to a farm that was nearer I saw her again, but then we drifted apart. During the third phase of our course the flying unfortunately took a backseat. Every now and then we'd be taken to Werder to fly a B2-class aircraft, the Junkers W34 and sometimes the Heinkel 51, but we still didn't get any combat training. All of that, we were told, would be done when we joined our unit. Although we were busy most of the time, it was clear to us that the Luftwaffe had not yet geared up to train pilots and officers en masse. The curriculum was constantly changing and it became obvious that they were really flying by the seat of their pants. Ours was one of the first courses and the others would be shaped by what they learned with us. It was difficult because we were training to be both officers and pilots, the officer training being substantially greater than the pilot training. There was the added complication that the German military machine was tuned to the army tradition and as officer cadets we had to laboriously learn the administrative system which ensured that the paperwork flowed in the regulation manner. The Luftwaffe was a new arm of the Wehrmacht and a lot of the traditional styles and reports were entirely inappropriate, but we had not developed to the point where our own administrative culture could take over. The range of work was also quite formidable, including courses on how to write orders, map reading, photographic charting and, of course, administrative science. All this time spent teaching us the rudiments of paperwork, but no time on subjects like communications or blind flying. We hadn't had a clue how fighters were supposed to communicate or what ground-to-air communication existed. This was because it was a new technology and couldn't be handed down by the army-based teaching staff. We soaked it all up and tried to make life as interesting as possible given the constraints. I had become friends with an Austrian, Otto Flach, who was to open my eyes regarding the attitudes of the Austrian people as they were annexed by Germany. We also shared some odd experiences together, particularly involving Oberleutnant Schmidt, our platoon's guiding officer. He had not become an officer through the usual route of selection, but had been promoted from NCO whilst serving with the Condor Legion in Spain. Apparently, he had been involved in some difficult bombing missions as an observer and, as a result, he had been promoted to the officer corps. He was obviously not as bright as the other officers and seemed to try to make up for his apparent lack of intelligence by complete adherence to the rules. It has been my experience since that a lot of people who don't have the flexibility of an agile brain take refuge within the structure of whatever rules and laws may be applied. I suppose it really is the case that the rules are for the guidance of wise men and the obedience of fools. In any event, in our judgment, Schmidt did some foolish things and that would have been okay in itself, but later I was to discover that there was an ominous side to this man which would directly affect me. We started to have problems one Sunday when Flach, myself and another friend decided to stay in barracks over the weekend. We didn't have enough money to go to Berlin and so we bought some bottles of cheap strawberry wine for the Saturday night. On Sunday we didn't dress but sat around in our pajamas and dressing gowns trying to cure our hangovers by finishing off the remains of the wine. Other officers in barracks would not have thought of room inspection on a Sunday wishing to relax themselves but not Schmidt. His quarters were close to our room and he decided to come in and see what we were doing. 
I suppose we weren't as attentive as we could have been, after all it was our day off. To add to this, I had become a little more relaxed since I had qualified for my pilot's license and didn't see myself having an extensive military career. I thought I would fly around the world taking photographs for magazines and books, rather than being a soldier for the rest of my life. We were also a little tipsy from the wine and the net result was that Schmidt must have been offended by an apparent lack of respect. I answered his questions about us not going to Berlin by saying that I couldn't afford it, that I, as a habit, only went out one weekend in four, preferring to budget my small amount of money than spend it. He didn't like this at all, it didn't fit his model of a cadet and he inspected my locker, checking my money bag. This just verified my statement, because there were only seven Pfennig there. That would have been alright, but in the room was a very good quality radio which was playing beautifully clear music. When I told him it was mine, he was confused. Here was a cadet who couldn't afford to go to Berlin, but who had a better quality radio than himself. In his mind, it must have marked me out as being different and that, to the inflexible mind, made me dangerous. The fact that I had chosen to budget my money and to buy quality things for myself rather than spending it all in Berlin didn't fit for Schmidt. The consequences of this encounter were to be more serious than I could have imagined. I had learned early on to handle my financial affairs positively. That has worked out well and I can confidently say that I have never really had trouble handling my money. Although I only had a little then, about 70 marks boosted by my 100 marks per month Fliegerzulage, my parents had said that we should make it a rule that when I wanted to buy something like my radio or essentials like my uniforms, they would pay half and I would pay off the rest in monthly installments. It would be a matter of principle for me to meet the payment and I never once missed. This applied to everything, even my little DKW car, which I was to buy later. My parents were happy to contribute, realizing that my military career was going to be a good deal cheaper in the end than if I had gone to university. Oberleutnant Schmidt didn't credit me with such planning and merely, I think, imagined that I was making fun of him. This was further reinforced by my next run-in with him. Our rooms were on the ground floor and just outside was the path which led to the classrooms. One afternoon, after lunch, I had taken a nap and overslept. Classes started at 1400 hours and it was already well past that time. I knew that if I went out of the room on the normal route, Schmidt, if he was in his room, would see me and there would be hell to pay for oversleeping. I decided to shut the door from the inside and hop out of the window. As my feet hit the soft grass beside the path, I looked up to see Schmidt standing there. He stood me to attention and ordered me to write a report on why an ensign should not jump out of a window. Jawohl, Herr Oberleutnant, was all I could say. I had been caught red-handed. I did write the report and it read something like this. To jump out of a window is an activity which sometimes may be the duty of a soldier, especially at war, when it frequently may become necessary. But, just as the individual soldier is not permitted to fire shots at will, he is not permitted to jump out of windows when there is no reason other than his own desire. When he decides to act without reason, he will always be reprimanded for it. Where would we be if everybody just jumped through a window when they felt like it? When an ensign jumps through a window, it is an indication that he has not only lost his good upbringing, but also his military discipline. Should such behavior be observed by the lower ranks, it would serve as a bad example in their education. However, there are circumstances which might require such action. For instance, if an ensign has overslept, he may only prove his zeal by jumping through the window, especially when living on the ground floor. When an ensign gets into a desperate situation, to reach his goal when there are two roads to take, one is closed and the other is the window, in such a case there is a great temptation to jump. Tactically, it's not too smart when the latter route is under observation and the goal can only be reached with heavy losses. In such a case, it would be quite objectionable for the ensign to jump through the window. He takes a chance that he will damage the window frame and instead of succeeding, he fails. As you can see, I had little respect for Schmidt and a report like this was going to do nothing to ingratiate me to him. Nor was the way in which the report was presented by me. Two days after the incident, I was due to present the report. Schmidt was to teach the class and we had assembled in the classroom before his arrival. All of my mates knew, by now, what had occurred and were interested in the outcome. I decided to read the report out to them from the front of the class, doing my best impersonation of Schmidt himself. As you can imagine, the report was met by howls of laughter and I became so enthusiastic that I didn't notice that the laughing had stopped and all eyes, except mine, were on the doorway. 
Too late, I looked up and saw that the infuriated Schmidt had entered the room during my recital. He could barely contain his anger, and he took the report from me. Two days later, I got it back, simply initialed Sch. What I didn't know was that my rather immature goading of Schmidt had resulted in a lengthy report on the unreliability of Enzing Steinhilper being placed in my personal dossier. It would be some time before I discovered how Schmidt had deliberately poisoned my record. Around July 1938, the rumor started to spread that we were to be posted to active units before the scheduled date for the end of our course. We were anxious about how the selection procedure would work, but in the end it was simple. Most of us were sent to either fighter or Stuka units. That was because our B2 rating was sufficient for this purpose, not requiring any more training. Some of the former NCOs had higher C2 qualifications from reconnaissance or bomber experience and they went off to more specialized work. We got the impression that the big build-up was in the fighter and Stuka wings and not so much with the bombers. Most of us were happy with the thought of flying the fighters and even the Stukas. We didn't know how vulnerable they would be when met by a skilled and determined enemy. From the routine of the school, all now suddenly changed. We were packing and saying our farewells as each left Wildpark for his unit. I was happy with my posting. But Eibling, near Rosenheim, south of Munich, only a few miles from the Bavarian Alps and not too far from home. The company was good too with two of my friends, Hinak Waller and Rudi Schmidt, who had no relation to Oberleutnant Schmidt, who were posted there too. There was good luck and bad too. We were all desperate to qualify on and fly the modern ME109, led by Oberst Max Ebel, a veteran of World War I, and some Condor Legion flyers like Oberleutnants Pitcairn and Priller. Hinek and I were assigned to a still unnamed group of new pilots consisting in the main of ensigns and NCOs. Rudi was soon flying the 109 whilst we sat around, not even knowing if we were a squadron or who was in command. We counted ourselves lucky that Rudi still deigned to talk to us all. The problem was that the Luftwaffe was expanding at such a rate that we were always ahead of the industry's capacity to supply modern planes and the Luftwaffe's ability to evolve a balanced structure of squadrons and appropriate personnel. Everyone was pulling strings to get aircraft and equipment and it was those who had officers with the best connections who got the cream of the supplies and personnel. There was no consolation in being able to fly either, even the most basic of aircraft were in short supply. But we did get some time on the Arado 68E, a biplane like the HE-51, but with the more up-to-date Junkers Jumo 210E engine, which delivered 640 horsepower. The Arados were supposed to have two fixed guns, but most of ours were without any armaments and devoid of any oxygen supply. Nobody even talked about radio communications, let alone see them fitted to any aircraft. I just wanted to fly, so I didn't bother too much with the waiting list for the Arados. I took the alternative. There were a couple of Focke-Wolf 56 Stößers, which had been built for aerobatics and fighter training. They were high-wing monoplanes with a fixed undercarriage and the Argos AS-10 inverted V8 engine developed 240 horsepower. It was a lovely little aircraft to fly. The officers weren't too much help to us at all. They spent most of their time trying to get posted to the more established veteran units. It was mostly left up to us to organize aircraft and to get what flying time we could. But there was still no tactical instruction, though sometimes an NCO a Condor veteran would offer to talk to us about dogfighting. I managed a few hours on the Arados, but still with no gunnery. The flying was great, going up and down the slopes of the mountains and chasing the sailboats on the nearby Chiemsee. Some of the veterans claimed to be able to blow boats over with their prop wash when passing over so low. I was simply amazed that there weren't any accidents or at least none I can remember. I had a near miss which taught me how unforgiving nature can be. I had the use of the Stößer, which was particularly good in the climb, practically hanging on the prop. I was having a great time when I saw some thunderclouds and decided to explore the inside. I built up the airspeed nicely and began a climb right through the center of the clouds, enjoying the shaking and turbulence immensely. Then, to my horror, I felt the airspeed fall off dramatically and, looking at my instruments, I could see that the aircraft was losing altitude. Instead of climbing, I was falling out of the sky. Suddenly, I dropped into the warm summer air again and was surrounded by a cloud of flying ice shards and crystals as it was stripped from the Stößer by the warm summer air. I had never thought there would be ice in the summer sky. And it is time for the after-action report. Ulrich in this episode meets a lot of semi-famous people. 
first of them being Anton Stangl, who would later go on to become a relatively well-known psychologist and leadership coach. Then he also meets Gustav Havemann, who came into favor with the Nazi party early during their reign, but was cast out when he argued in favor of Jewish musicians. He was branded a Bolshevik, but luckily left alone for the duration of the war. He went and became a teacher in communist East Germany afterwards. Next, it is once again intriguing how there are so many parallels between the ways of the armed forces back then and now. The written report, as Ulrich had to endure, still exists today as the lowest form of disciplinary measures in the German army. I myself have used it many times. It is especially frustrating for conscripts who do wrong because it eats into their free time. It works beautifully and you don't even have to raise your voice to do it. Same goes for the drunken exploits like wrestling hot stoves with your bare hands. I myself have once headbutted a cowbell so hard that I got a rather long cut on my forehead. I still have the scar, in fact. And finally, Fasching, or Carnival as it is known. This is very, very popular where I currently live, which is the Cologne area, and people will party non-stop for days, literally, and the entire region will practically come to a standstill. You either love it or hate it, and there is no in-between. Guess where I stand on this, and let me know in the comments what you think. Until next time, stay safe, cheers and bye bye.